Hi folks, it's Mike McDonald here. It's been a while since I've posted a video on my aviation channel, um, but I have noticed that uh, in spite of that, um, I have more subscribers and I have some key videos that have, are being consumed at a fairly good rate, which I'm happy to see, um, notably from my E6B playlist series. Um, I will do more E6B videos, but I've decided that I'd like to try an experiment on this channel and make a, a new series on this channel that is based on the uh, Transport Canada Flight Training Manual. And it's the exercises that you go through as a, as a pilot, as a student pilot, uh, learning uh, all of the details of becoming a pilot. Um, each lesson, like for example, say turns or, uh, or climbs or descents, um, stalls, et cetera, um, each one is covered in an individual lesson, and there are 30 lessons um, that are covered in the Transport Canada uh, Flight Training Manual and in the regime of flight training in Canada. Now, it's not a heck of a lot different in the United States. There are some differences. I do notice that a lot of my um, viewers are from the United States, and I really appreciate that. I love you Americans very much. I wish I could fly down there, actually. Uh, but that's another story for another time. Yeah, so there's... 30 exercises that your flight instructor will take you through as you go through the regime of becoming a pilot, either a private pilot or a commercial pilot. Um, so each one of these exercises is flown in the air in an airplane with an instructor and of course practice once you've gone solo. And each one of these exercises has what we call a preparatory ground instruction. Now that's not to be confused with, with, um, with uh, ground school. Uh, preparatory ground instruction happens um, between the student and the instructor um, just before the flight. Um, so we call them PGIs. And so this is going to be a series of PGIs. Um, they're very important because they test the knowledge of the students, they help fill in gaps, and they give the student an expectation of, of what's going to happen during the lesson. And um, it takes a little bit of the mysticism out of, out of the flight lessons. And I, I think a good instructor should always do a PGI before a flight. And they're, they're not very long. As a matter of fact, they're designed and we're, we're told as instructors to not make them long-winded or deeply technical. They're just covering the points that will be covered in the air by the instructor. So it's always a good plan to go over this stuff before you go flying. And of course, as mandated by Transport Canada, we are actually required to conduct PGIs or preparatory ground instruction on each flight lesson with our student. Ideally, they should, a PGI should be done at least 24 hours before um, the flight. I prefer to do it in the 15 or 20 minutes before we prepare the airplane and go offline. Now there are 30 and uh, as I said, they cover all of the flight exercises that you'll go through in the uh, instruction regime. Um, the first two familiarization and preparation for flight, they're covered quite nicely in the flight training manual. And I'm not gonna cover them here in the series simply because um, anybody who's interested in becoming a pilot will probably have voraciously read the first couple of uh, chapters at any rate. And they you know, cover things like you know, airplane fuel systems and what are the gauges in the airplane and what's the GPS and um, what are the various parts of an airplane. How do they function, et cetera, et cetera. They're just very basic things. But when you get into the actual flying portion, because you know, PGIs and ground instruction or ground school, there is some cross fertilization between the two, of course. Topics that you find in ground school for your private commercial pilot would also show up in PGIs and vice versa. All right, so I'm just going to skip one and two, which is familiarization and preparation for flight, and go to the first nitty gritty of the nitty gritty um, PGIs that are, that are related to each flight lesson or flight exercise. So the first one that comes up on my series is ancillary controls. Now, ancillary control sounds a little bit mystifying. So let's look at that. All right, here we are. I'll just put myself up here in the corner here. So as you can see, it's called exercise three, ancill ancillary controls. And there's a structure to PGIs that uh, instructions are, instructors are encouraged to follow. And so these PGIs are pre-prepared by me and have been used by myself um, while teaching people how to fly. And um, 
you know, I've, I've done them enough that I can sort of do them off of memory, but it's always good to have the text here. So I'm going to show you the text as I go through this PGI. Now, a PGI involves querying a student to see what the answers are and then correcting any errors um, along the way. Um, but in this, in this uh, YouTube world where I'm not live and I'm not taking comments back and forth, it's a one-way street. So I'm going to play the role of the student and the instructor in a way, or I'll just give the answers as we go through here. And this will be great for you. Those of you who are starting your flying training because you'll get a sense of what PGIs are about. You'll have expectations and hopefully you'll really appreciate them and rely on them to help you get through your flight training quicker. Because, you know, not only does a PGI um, help prepare the student for a particular flight exercise, it also makes things go smoother and quicker. And we all know that quicker means cheaper or less expensive. So I think we're all on board with that. So without further ado, let's look at exercise number three from the flight training manual, ancillary controls. So I'll just read from the text right here. Perhaps the most glamorous controls in an airplane are the stick or control column and the throttle, another set of controls. The ancillary controls are crucial to the optimal safe and uh, let me start that again. Perhaps the most glamorous controls in an airplane are the stick and the throttle, but the ancillary controls are crucial to the optimal safe operation of any airplane. All airplanes have them to some degree or another, and our trusty Cessna Landomatic or Piper is no exception. Without these controls, the precise and safe aspects of airmanship would be impossible. So obviously this is an important um, exercise in flight training. So what is the definition of ancillary controls, you might ask? Well, the answer is right here. Uh, providing necessary support to the primary activities or operation of an organization, institution, industry, or system. System, all right, so that's the definition of ancillary. I would imagine system is what we're looking at here as an aircraft is just a conglomerate of a bunch of systems. All right, so then we have what's called the TKT, the, the knowledge test. And this is something that we talk to the students. We want to get a sense of what knowledge they have, whether they've been studying or they're ahead of the curve or behind the curve. So uh, here's four questions that, that an instructor could ask you. Uh, first question is, can you name the ancillary controls found in the average GA airplane? And they are carburetor heat or carb heat, mixture, heating, and ventilation. Number two. How are the mixture and carb heat controls interrelated? Well, both affect the mixture of the fuel to the air to the engine. Number three, which of the ancillary controls are useful or even crucial in emergency situations? Well, they all are, but uh, emergency procedures, especially when it comes to fires, carbon monoxide poisoning, et cetera, or, or nausea, um, they focus on ventilation, so fresh air in the airplane. And the fourth question is, can you give me three reasons that I, environmental controls affect the flight? So thinking of, of, you know, the human factor of a pilot, it would be comfort. So that's human factors, and it relates to fires and visibility. So let's just move on to the mixture control. And here's some of the questions that could be asked in the mixture control for the with regards to the mixture control. All right, why do airplanes use a mixture control? Well, it affects the performance, the fuel economy, the smoothness and healthiness of the engine. Number two, how does the mixture control address the fuel air mixture? Oh, that's a very interesting thing. Um, the answer to that is that it actually adjusts the amount of fuel that goes into the carburetor. Basically, it's a fuel valve. A lot of people think that when you push the throttle, on an airplane or a car that you are adding more fuel into the engine, thus making the engine go faster, but that's actually not the case. What we're actually doing is adjusting the amount of air that is burned with the fuel, all right? And that affects the power of the engine or the speed of the RPMs. So um, that being the case, you can imagine how the mixture control is important in terms of the fuel air ratio. So how do we manipulate the mixture control? Well, we adjust for the best fuel air mixture during cruise, which ideally in your standard GA um, reciprocating engine, carbureted engine is a one to 14 ratio. That's one part fuel 
in weight to 14 parts air in weight. So um, that's basically our performance aspect. And we have um, the, the mixture controls is important in terms of like when you're going to the performance section of your pilot operating handbook and you're looking at the various power, power amounts and uh, RPM settings in cruise, they um, automatically assume that you're leaning for the proper 14 to 1 ratio. Also, the mixture control affects the heating and cooling of the engine. All right, so cooling the engine in the, in the climb, right? Because enriching mixture means there's more fuel than the 14 to one, say for example, and that fuel actually cools the tops of the cylinders, right? It actually cools the top of the cylinders. If you reduce the amount of fuel to air, and now you have more air to fuel, it burns quicker and the cylinders will actually increase their heat. So here's a, here, in number four, the question is what happens when the mixture setting is too lean? Well, then you would have detonation. And uh, I'm not gonna go deep into detonation, but it's not a good thing. It's very hard on the engine. And too rich would be unburnt fuel forming gunk on the plug. So fouling the plugs. So number five, when do we use the mixture? Well, above 3000 feet mean sea level, Okay, during ground taxi, you can optimize the fuel. So above 3000 feet, you wanna lean the engine to, to the peak 14 to one ratio. Uh, during ground taxiing, you wanna lean because you don't wanna foul the plugs. And of course, optimizing the fuel economy in cruise and creating a smoother engine, a smoother running engine. And here's a safety question. What can happen if we misuse the mixture control? And some of the answers would be, uh, well, you, if, you, if you run it too lean, you can get to the point where you actually starve the engine of fuel. And of course, you can risk engine failure or having a rough engine or even an engine stoppage and climb if you're over lean the engine. Making sure that full rich is used when taking off or going around below 3000 MSL. Remember that the higher elevation that the airport's at, the thinner the air, so therefore there's more fuel to air than the 14 to one ratio. So leaning above 3000 MSL is simply creating the best mixture to give the most power during the climb out from takeoff. So that's why we, we lean above 3000. Some flight schools actually tweak the carburetors, the, has the mechanic tweak the carburetors so that you can have the carburetor set full rich which is actually designed to be leaned enough for um, altitudes or elevations above 3000 feet, field elevations. So that's the mixture, just talking about the mixture. And then we'll talk about the carburetor heat, which is one of the three sort of main uh, ancillary controls. So some questions would be like this. What is carburetor ice, All right? Well, the answer is that that's ice that flow that forms in the venturi of the carburetor due to moisture and, and due to moisture um, that actually plugs up the venturi where the air goes in to the carburetor and can actually change the mixture drastically and eventually um, starve the engine of air, which would make it too rich and it would stall. So what causes carburetor ice? Well, <clears throat> 20 to 30 degree temperature drop in the venturi and a plus 38 to minus 10 outside air temperature with humidity or operation in cloud. And there's a carb ice graph, which is in the flight training manual that will sort of quickly, and a lot of flight, a lot of flight schools have carb ice graphs, um, very handy um, so that students and pilots can assess the chances of carb ice. So there's a carb ice graph right there. And basically it's showing that between the minus 10 and the plus 30, um, uh, the minus 10 and the plus 30 air to ambient air temperature, and then the dew point, in other words, the saturation of, of, uh, of water in the air or the presence of water in the air, as the dew point increases, you can see, and as the temperature is in the proper range, you can see you have the most chance of carb ice 
lesser chance and least chance of car bites. So if you're operating in this range with um, dew points of minus 10 to 30 degrees and temperatures between well, pretty much 30 degrees plus 30 degrees Celsius and minus 10, you have a good chance of forming car bites. So you must be aware of that. How does the carburetor heat control operate? Well, there's an alternate heated air source. Okay, so let's just talk about the air coming into the engine. On the front of the engines, you'll, uh, you'll see, like say on a Cessna, you'll see a little grill, okay? And that's where the air comes in through a filter and then is rooted up and into the carburetor, all right? But we have an alternate heated source of air, which is heated by the exhaust plumbing of the aircraft, right? So it's not actually the exhaust air, but it's a shroud that surrounds the exhaust, which is very hot, the exhaust tube. And it allows you to take the heated air from elsewhere in the engine compartment, unfiltered by the way, there's not a filter in, in the carb heat. Um, and then that'll run that into the carburetor instead. Okay, and that's what melts the ice or prevents the ice from forming in high carb heat scenarios, like say flying in misty weather or clouds. So the bypass air filter is warmed up by the exhaust heat. So when do we use carburetor heat? Well, um, those of you who are flying a carbureted airplanes, um, especially the Cessna, uh, a little bit to the lesser degree with the Piper products, but still, if your RPM is less than 2100 or is out of the green uh, when descending, the green on the, on the RPM gauge, uh, when descending or when symptoms occur. So that's when you use carburetor heat. How do you know if it's necessary while in cruise or descent and climb? Well, if there's engine roughness or an RPM drop or even an engine stoppage, so you can pull on the carb heat and melt that ice and get that engine running smoothly again. How do you know if the carb heat has been effective? Well, if you were experiencing carb ice, then of course, turning on the carb heat What's going to happen is it's going to start to melt the ice and then chunks of the ice are going to go into the cylinders or into the intake manifold of the engine. Now that will actually cause the engine to temporarily run even rougher and it might be a little bit frightening, but if you leave it on long enough and once all of the ice is melted and vaporized and then flushed through the system, um, the engine will smooth up and it'll be running uh, as per normal operation again. Um, and a, another question that would be asked is how does the use of carb heat, it says car heat here, let's just change that. How does the use of carb heat relate to the use of the mixture control? Well, they both, um, <clears throat> when you apply carb heat, of course, the hot air is less dense than cool air. So if you apply carb heat, you're automatically changing the mixture into the intake manifold. You're making the mixture richer. Okay, so um, if you were using carb heat and you had to use the carb heat continually, you would lean out the mixture to compensate for that less dense hot air entering the carburetor. So uh, typically though, we, when we're starting our descent and especially when we're in that temperature and dew point range, we just turn on the carb heat and leave it on as we do our approach to landing. But there are some cases where you're in cruise on a long flight and you find that you use the carburetor heat. Um, you, you have to continue to use the carburetor heat, which is a rare condition in most, in most environmental settings. Um, oh, then of course, you've got to realize that you've just enriched the mixture and then now you have, you have an inefficient fuel burn, uh, burning too much fuel. So you can lean and you can use your RPM gauge or exhaust gas temperature um, or cylinder head temperature gauges to optimize for that 14, that one to 14 ratio that we talked about it earlier. So as you can see, they're coming to get me. As you can see, um, carburetor heat and the mixture are closely related. So those are two very important ancillary controls in a normally aspirated engine. Now, of course, if you're flying uh, an aircraft with fuel injection, you are not going to have um, carburetor heat control at all. You will still have a mixture control. And the starting procedure is a little bit different than your standard normally aspirated engine. And then uh, we have a little safety question about their safety 
comments about the carburetor heat and the, the carburetor heat control. Um, safety, how does the improper usage of carburetor heat affect climb, cruise, and descent? And the answer would be, well, you have um, reduced RPM, you could have critical icing, uh, causing carb icing by using the carb heat under certain conditions. What? Wait a minute. Are you saying to me that turning the carb heat on can actually cause carb ice? Well, that sounds counterintuitive, but actually, if you think about it, it's true. If you have the right conditions in the outside air, in other words, a high dew point, and your temperature in the air was below that range, below the minus 20, say, and then you use the carburetor heat and actually brought the temperature into the carburetor up because of that into the range that carb ice could form. It is possible that on very cold days with ice crystals in the air, which I have experienced myself, that inducing carb, that turning on the carb heat could actually induce carb ice, but that would be a temporary condition if you left it on. So something to keep in mind. Of course, uh, fuel economy and engine power are affected by carb heat. When you turn the carb heat on, because you have a richer mixture now, your fuel economy is going to take a dump, all right? And, and also that the engine is not going to generate as much power as if it was properly leaned, like say, for example, in a go around, all right? So, you know, many of us have forgotten to turn off the carb heat when we're doing circuits on the next takeoff. And uh, of course, we've just compromised the power abilities of the engine. Um, oftentimes it doesn't have any consequences, but occasionally the consequences can be very dire. So engine leaning and the use of carburetor heat, you know, if you're below 3,000 feet, you want to have that mixture rich. If you're above 1,000, above 3,000 feet, I'm talking about on the takeoff, so field elevation, you want to have that mixture set for peak power. Um, and of course, the carb heat off. So turning the carb, so leaving the carb heat on in on a go around or on a takeoff from a circuit um, is not good. The other thing, too, is that if you leave the carburetor heat on and say you're idling on the ground, there's unfiltered air that's getting into the engine. And over time, that's going to deteriorate the engine. It's going to it's going to damage the engine. So let's talk about environmental controls. So what are the most common environmental controls used in GA airplanes? Well, they are cabin heat and it's associated defogger and upper and lower ventilation. All right, so on a Cessna 172, generally cabin heat means it comes out from below the dash and the defogger works usually not ideally, um, but uh, kind of like an old Volkswagen. But yeah, that's basically what they, what they are, the environmental controls. Um, and ventilation also includes on many airplanes, the little vents, like say in the high wing airplanes, the little knobs that you pull out and you can direct cool air that comes in through holes in the uh, in, at the root of the wing inboard that just sends nice fresh air into the airplane. So how do they affect how do these controls affect the uh, cockpit environment? Well, they increase comfort or badly used decrease comfort. Uh, visibility, let's say for the example of defogging. And then how that affects our human factors such as fatigue, nausea, and visibility. So when would you use the environmental, when would use of environmental controls affect the safety during an emergency? Well, during emergency, so you'll notice some of the, some of the procedures are you have to stop, like say, for example, a fire, you need to close the vents to stop fresh air from coming in and fueling the fire until you get the fire out. And then of course you open them up and ventilate, right? So cabin fires. Um, if there's carbon monoxide leaking in through the heating system, well, then obviously you're going to have to turn off the heat and ventilate, right? Because carbon monoxide poisoning is, you know, um, very similar to hypoxia and will eventually uh, kill you. So this is not good in flight. So ventilation is important. So using the vents, usually there's a knob, like say on a Cessna and other products, um, you pull it and then cool air or fresh air comes in through the cowl of the engine into the cabin and of course overhead vents and 
you know, opening up windows and little sliding windows and all that good stuff, right? It's gonna, gonna affect the quality of the air inside and it's gonna keep you at peak performance as a pilot. So some final notes that are often gone over in PGIs uh, about the various controls, of the ancillary controls, the three types, mixture, carb, heat, environmental controls. It's just remember that fuel economy when it comes to mixture is your friend and managing the engine temperature is crucial to the reliability and longevity of an engine. A smooth engine gets you into the air or back into the air when you most need it. So you need to understand how a mixture affects power of the engine and the amount of fuel that you burn. When it comes to carb heat, well, carb ice can kill you uh, indirectly through causing engine stoppage. Um, at the inappropriate times, you know, an engine stoppage at altitude, you've got some time to pick a field and glide in the land, but on a go around or takeoff, uh, you have much less time and things are very critical and things are coming at you fast. You should always check the air, outside air temperature. That's why we keep these, these little graphs often around different flying schools, um, little sheets, photocopies of these and encourage people when they're doing the weight imbalance and after they pre-flighted the airplane and doing their uh, nav planning, et cetera, to make sure that they understand the conditions that could contribute to carb ice. So that's important. Uh, so be aware of air humidity and anticipate, you know, that you may need to use the carb ice before it bites you. So check the METAR, the TAS, and the uh, area forecasts and the local weather sources for high humidity uh, and in those temperature ranges, uh, minus 10 to plus 30 degrees. And also when you're flying, get used to looking at that outside air temperature. A lot of people ignore that thing. Um, oftentimes it's on one of those overhead vents in a Cessna or it's a digital or whatever. You just want to know what the outside air temperature is. Uh, with regards to environmental controls, you want to fly comfortably, right? And you want to manage the comfort of your passengers. Okay, like for example, um, oftentimes, you know, I, I, if I do a familiarization flight, um, usually with a couple or with a few people, um, you usually have one person who's really keen on going flying and probably is less prone to air sickness. Um, oftentimes the other passenger who's along for the ride and looking forward to the view, you have to be very aware that they could, especially in bumpy air, um, could become air sick. And more than once, more than once, you know, um, being really diligent about flying as smoothly as possible and opening those vents and getting fresh air in um, has managed to uh, avoid the situation of somebody having to use the air sick bag in the back seat or beside you, or even, you know, how, <laughs> you know, how viral air sickness can be. Even the pilot can find themselves starting to feel sick if the passengers are feeling sick. So the air quality in the cabin is like primo, primo, primo important. All right. It's important for the comfort of your passenger, your student and yourself. Right. And never underestimate the power of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, and when a cabin or engine fire happens, how to manage the quality of the air that comes into the comes into the cabin. All right? You don't want to have a bunch of fresh air flowing into the cabin while you're starting to put out a fire. All right. That's the time to close the vents. All right. Uh, you can open the vents to clear the air after you've got the fire out. And uh, also, you know, if, if oftentimes you get these little badges that go in the airplane on the dashboard that it's got a little circle in it and it indicates whether there's carbon monoxide in the air. So you want to keep an eye on that and make sure you change them regularly. And if there's any indications of carbon monoxide or if you experience the symptoms related to carbon monoxide, which you can look up in the various sources, um, you want to get that heat off and get the fresh air into the airplane. So that's why that's important. And that's it. So there's your first PGI in my series, uh, exercise three, ancillary controls. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, you have to pardon me, I'm a little bit rusty. I haven't done some of these videos in quite some time. But uh, I never look for perfection when I make these videos. I'm just looking to, um, to cover all the bases and uh, make the odd mistake here and there. It's not the end of the world, right? We all make mistakes. That's how we learn. So thanks very much. And the next video that will be coming up will be exercise four, which is taxiing. Sounds simple, huh? That's what they all say until the first time they have to do it. Anyways, until next time, I hope you have tailwinds in your flying and take care, everybody. Bye-bye.